Hello, everyone. I'm Dana Cunningham, Dean of the Tisch College of Civic Life here at Tufts. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's Tisch College event, which is generously supported by Tufts University's Civic Studies program. I'm also honored to virtually welcome Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author Farah Stockman to Tufts for a conversation about her recent book, American Made, What Happens to People When Work Disappears? Just released earlier this month, American Made shares the stories of three very different people who worked at the same Indianapolis plant, Shannon, Wally, and John. And what happens to them when their employer, the Rexnord Corporation, shuts down that plant in 2017? As you will discover when you read it, American Made is a story of a community struggling to reinvent itself. It is also a story about race, class, and American values, and how jobs serve as a bedrock of people's lives, and how the struggle for jobs drives powerful social justice movements. This book shines a light on a crucial political moment when joblessness and anxiety about the future work have made themselves heard at the national level. A journalist by trade, Farah, Farah joined the New York Times editorial board in 2020 after covering politics, social movements, and race for the national desk. She previously spent 16 years at the Boston Globe and spent nearly half of that time as the paper's foreign policy reporter in Washington, DC. Throughout her time there, Farah reported from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, South Sudan, Rwanda, and Guantanamo Bay. While at the Globe, she also served as a columnist and an editorial board member. In 2016, she won the Pulitzer Prize for a series of columns about the efforts to desegregate Boston schools. Joining Farah in conversation tonight is Peter Levine, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Lincoln Filene Professor of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Tisch College and the Program Director of the Civic Studies Program at Tufts. While Peter's primary appointment is at Tisch College, he also holds tenure as a full professor in political science and has additional appointments in philosophy, science and technology studies, international relations, Tufts University College, the Data Intensive Sciences Center, the Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute, and the Center for Humanities at Tufts. And if all that weren't enough, Peter also co-leads the university-wide research group on equity in health, wealth, and civic engagement. Trained as a moral and political philosopher, Peter has spent most of his career conducting applied empirical research and organizing professional efforts related to civic life in the United States, including sustained work on civic education, voting rights, public deliberation, social movements, and the measurement of social capital. He is the author of eight books, including most recently, We Are the Ones We Have Been Waiting For, The Promise of Civic Renewal in America, and the forthcoming What Should We Do? Political Theory with Citizens at the Center. Prior to his time at Tufts and Tisch College, Peter worked for Common Cause, the Institute for Philosophy and Public Policy at the University of Maryland, and the National Commission for Civic Renewal. He later founded and led CIRCLE, the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement. For many years before, uh, for many years before CIRCLE became part of Tisch College. Thank you to our guests for joining us tonight. And I'm looking forward to an engaging conversation. Please join me in welcoming Farah Stockman and Peter Levine. Thanks so much, Dana, for the introductions and for joining us. And thanks, Farah, for joining us here at, at Tufts virtually um, and for writing the book, which is, a, which is a fantastic book. So I do want to plug it for a second. I, I finished it over the weekend. It's, um, it's moving. It's rich. It's complicated. It's actually uh, quite suspenseful. Um, I, had a, I had very strong emotional reactions, actually, to the book more than usual. Um, so it's a, it's a beautiful book in its, in its own way. And we're so glad to have you here joining us this evening. And thanks to everybody else for joining us on the on the Zoom call. Well, um, thanks for having me. I should just say that I, I am thrilled to be here because I actually wrote the last part of this book at the Tisch College Library. Um, my husband works uh, works alongside you and, and told me the secret of, of the Tisch College Library. And so I'm super grateful uh, for that opportunity. I'm very grateful to be here tonight. I noticed we were in your acknowledgments. The, li that is the library was in your acknowledgments. <laughs> yes, so, yes. you know. um, 
so I have all these questions I want to get uh, into. And actually, as I, I was saying to you, I actually have about 30 more questions that we definitely don't have time to get to. Um, be, uh, basically, I, the, 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 the message the book sends to me is I want to pick your brain because of the research you did for the book. But do you want to just say to start with a few words about how you wrote how you wrote the book and what it is so that because we're assuming most people haven't had a chance to read it yet. So just just say what the book's yeah. about. Yeah. Sure. So the the seed of the book started on election night in 2016, when um, I was stunned, like probably many of, of you, uh, when so many millions of Americans voted for a man who had not served even one day in government um, and elected him president of the United States. How could that be? And I'm from the Rust Belt. I'm from Michigan. So I started asking around, why Donald Trump? Why Donald Trump? And I kept hearing, he's going to save the factories. He's going to bring the factories back. Um, and if you remember at the time, there were these rallies. He would have these rallies and, and ask you know, workers who were employed at factories that were moving away, you know, is there anyone here from Carrier? Is there anyone here from this plant or that plant? And call out your years of seniority. And they'd all be in the audience calling out you know, 10 years, 18 years. So I decided to follow workers at a plant in Indianapolis that he had tweeted about that was shutting down and moving to Monterey. Um, and just to see like, what does that feel like um, to be told that your job is going away because those people over here are gonna do it cheaper. And I followed a woman named Shannon for seven months as the factory shut down and Shannon was agonizing, do I train my Mexican replacement or do I refuse? And the union didn't want her to do it. Um, and she ended up doing it for the small bonus and, and um, she ended up um, kind of having a, a bond with the guy she trained. And, and um, anyway, I don't wanna to have too many spoiler alerts, but mm -hmm. people, the readers, um, you know, I wrote this in the New York Times in 2017 and readers from all over the world said, let us know what happened to Shannon. Let us know how, you know, where she gets another job. And so I followed her for the rest of the Trump administration. And I followed two of her coworkers as well, a black man named Wally and a white guy named John. And we get we get in essence bio biographies of them all three that go back to their childhood and then proceed after the closing of the of the factory. But there's an intense period there where the factory is under pressure for closing. They are, the workers are being required to train um, Mexican workers who will get the jobs, and Donald Trump gets elected president. Um, so I, I, let me plunge in with a question. Uh, early in the book, I think maybe it's in the intro. You say that you remember that your parents used to argue sometimes about race. Um, when a waitress was rude, your your mom, who's black, would openly suspect in the family that she that the waitress was being racist at that moment. And your white father, quote, thought she must be cranky after a long day on her feet. And you say, I always wondered which one was right. That is why I became a journalist to talk to the waitress. <laughs> and as I read, I thought, okay, that's a metaphor for the book, because you're talking to industrial workers in the um, in, in the uh, Midwest, who uh, some of whom at least voted for Donald Trump, and that question is floating there. And particularly the four hour conversation you have with John about race in his house after when you know him already, you realize that he has a Confederate flag in his garage. So I thought that was talking to the waitress and metaphorically. And I'm, so I wanted you to talk about sort of why, why do you want to talk, why do you want to, why do you want to do that? And what do you, what do you think you're going to get out of it? And what, what do we? What, what should the rest of us learn from from you? Well, um, it's a big question. I mean, I my mother grew up in Jim Crow, Mississippi. She attended segregated schools her entire childhood, and has you know has seen uh, her whole life uh, how race uh, shapes her experience, right? And um, she, I don't want to make it. You know, she, she's. Um, an incredible ambassador almost. She's, uh, you know, of excellence from out of Mississippi, but she she definitely <laughs> suspects uh, if, if mm -hmm. someone's rude to an interracial family, that's the reason. And my father, you know, grew up in, Miss, in, uh, in Pennsylvania and never had those experiences firsthand. And so he would always, you know, 
I, it, it was so race conversations in my childhood dinner table. This was normal to to talk about these things really openly and and debate them really. Um, so I learned very early on that two, depending on what you've experienced, two two very intelligent people can look at the same events and come to very different conclusions. Mm -hmm. And so this sort of taking it a step further, like, is there an object, is there an objective reality? Can you, can you go to go through and really determine is, is the waitress, what is, what's going through her mind, um, when she is serving our family and, um, yeah, so I, I don't know, the conversation I had with John, who was the white worker, you know, the whole time I'm, I'm trying to, to learn about their lives, to understand their lives and their political views and what they think about race. I have all my own preconceptions of who they are. Um, and yet I'm always looking for, you know, you know, I'm looking for that Confederate flag and don't, don't see it until the very <laughs> end of the book. Yeah. Um, so, um, it, and it was, you know, I was very, it was, a, I was very torn about how to feel about it by then because I knew so many other things about John that defied my expectations. So, um, including some moments of solidarity with black co-workers. Very much. I mean, I, yeah. John yeah. was a diehard union guy who had fought for, uh, black workers to have their jobs and had many more, interracial friendships than most of the white collar people I know here in Boston. Right. And so it was, you know, it was a, people are complicated and not, you know, they, they defy stereotype a lot, but, you know, as a journalist, I've talked to people all over the world and, you know, usually I learn the most from those who don't think like me. Um, right. And I would like to come back if we have, if we have time to the, the comparison between the world that frankly you and I both live in in Cambridge, Mass, and, and the world in the Indianapolis, the working class world there. But because you're pretty hard on our world, actually, oh. and you're respectful of theirs. And that Sorry. I think, Sorry. I think, no, no, I, 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 I agree, but I'd like to talk about that a little more. But let's talk a minute about John. He's the, he's the white man of the three. Yeah. Um, he is, as you said, he's a militant union guy. He, he's not just in his opinions, he, he actually is a, is a vice president and he wants to confront the union. He has a worldview, you say, which is divided into the capitalists and the workers and the capitalists are to be challenged, comes out of his history and his family. Um, one thing that, that intrigued me was, but he also votes for Trump. He's the one who votes for Trump. Um, and one thing that intrigued me was his wife's a little more management. She's a, got a role that's a little more management and they argue and she takes the management side and he thinks she's being a liberal. Yeah, and yeah. I just wanted to probe on that because that and some other evidence made me think that he views liberals as as corporate elite, as corporate. corporate. And I just corporate. wanted to educated corporate. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and why does he think that? I mean, it's not. I'm not saying he shouldn't. Yeah. I'm not disagreeing. Yeah. Just, why does he well, think that? Yeah, it, it's it. Yes, I mean, it, let's go back to the, what the Democratic Party, you know, was. So when John. John came from a long line of union men. They were coal miners in Kentucky. And, he, you know, going back to his great grandfather, no one had ever voted for a Republican. Like in these families, there was, uh, they, they were Democrats. And this was a pillar of the Democratic Party. Unions were a pillar. And so John and um, uh, his, friend, his friend Tim, who had a very similar history, would talk about how, you know, when they were raised, they were told that the Republicans were for the greedy corporations and the Democrats were for the little, the working man, the little guy. And um, it, it was, you know, all the way up to Bill Clinton. And they really, they, they thought this way, they believed this. And, um, and if you looked at back, back then, the, the, the less educated you were, the more likely you were to be a Democrat. Where, uh, whereas, you know, once you went to college and, and got that degree, you were going to get on, climb the corporate ladder and become a Republican like that. That's how it used to be. Um, and I think Bill Clinton was kind of a turning point. He tells the world, he tells the American people, globalization is here. Uh, it's not going away. We have to embrace it. And he negotiates NAFTA, which is the first treaty with a low wage country. Um, he also um, uh, oversees China's um, entrance into the WTO, 
the World Trade Organization. And those are two things that these workers blame for the loss of their jobs. So all these people remember, you know, Tim and John, they remember loving Bill Clinton. He's a Democrat. He's a little guy like me. Uh, and then their factories close. And so uh, John's friend Tim's factory goes to Shanghai. This plant now goes to Mexico, you know. And so when they lose their jobs, they say, the Democrats got in bed with the corporations while no one was looking. It was a sellout job. It was a sellout job. And they got really angry and, and they felt betrayed. They were almost, and it's funny because you, you say, well, the Republicans were no better on free trade. In fact, they were worse, right? Um, but the, the feeling of betrayal was deep. And, and you know, they, they didn't actually, um, they didn't like Mitt Romney. They didn't really vote for Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney's the kind of guy who would have sent your factory away. Um, John actually voted for Obama in 20 and 2008 because if you remember Obama campaigned on renegotiating NAFTA but um, anyway by, by the time Trump comes along and starts saying I'm going to save your jobs I'm going to save your factories they were they were ready to hear it and they were waiting for that message so let's let's talk a little bit more about the role of education because you just mentioned that that the person that people um that bill clinton said we should all basically get more education to get in the global in the global world and i um i was sort of keeping track and i think that maybe i'm wrong but i think college is basically bad for almost everybody in your book there's a whole bunch of people who take on some get some college they have to borrow they don't get a degree so college is just for them a scam and then there's a few who get college degrees and they don't really get much benefit from it. And then the extra layer is the people who take away their job or who come and take over the factory and give, and give them stupid instructions and don't know what they're talking about have college degrees. So to me, it, college was almost a, 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 it almost felt like a conspiracy against the people in your book. It's almost, it's almost set up to take away their hard earned, earned dollars and give them nothing back. And of course that's pretty, here we are metaphorically at Tufts on, on Zoom. So what do we, what should we think about this? So for someone like John, he would see college as kind of a, a Ponzi scheme, right? Like you're, it's it's a way to collect money for from people, um, and and you know, you'll incur all this debt and then be standing behind a rent counter. And, and these are not people who are going to colleges like Tufts, by the way. They're not right. as as prestigious as Tufts. They 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 might be colleges that people have never heard of. Um, so there's a difference there. But um, I will say that Shannon Stoddard got a nursing degree and mm. she's doing great. Oh, okay. And so yeah. um, I, um, anyone with any ambition, almost to a person that I met in Indianapolis, wanted to become a nurse. So that's the one exception is, is people becoming nurses in healthcare. Um, that seemed to pay off. But um, yeah, I think that um, my big, one of my big takeaways from the book is that all the decisions in this country, almost every decision of any import in this country is made by people with not only college degrees, but advanced degrees, law degrees, uh, you know, master's degrees, PhDs. And yet we represent a tiny slice of the United States, right? So um, I, I think one third of American adults have, have bachelor's degrees. It's an incredible privilege to get a bachelor's degree and then let alone a law degree or a or a PhD, I mean, by the time you go to advanced degrees, I think it's 13%. I couldn't name one person in my life that I interact with on a daily basis who doesn't have a BA. And yet those are the vast majority of, of people in this country. And so when you hear them talk about the elite, you know, the elite um, and with such, um, I don't know, anger almost, this is kind of where it comes from is that the people who, who make the policies are pretty, they're, they're divorced from the economic realities of a lot of everyday working people. And they are not even geographically close to them, right? Um, you know, we live in a very prosperous area where just owning a house was going to make you rich. If you owned a house in, in the Boston area for the last 20 years, you did really well. Um, that's not true for huge swaths of the United States where there's just been downward mobility. So someone like John has seen his pay drop from $28 to $25 to, you know, by you know, to $17. It's real. And so yeah, that's where some of this grievance comes from. 
Just to give voice to, and Ms. Shannon had a strong quote, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I'm for the one who will keep good paying jobs here for us uneducated people that build the parts that make them rich. And I thought that was a nice, I thought that was an eloquent moment for her. Um, and she owns being uneducated, us un uneducated people. Yeah, yeah and I, I should say that Shannon was an amazing person to get to know because she was not at all what I expected a steel worker to be, right? She's a, she's a woman. And she had worked her, she was a, she was kind of this blue collar feminist who had worked her way up from janitor to like managing these explosive furnaces, essentially. And it was a job that, you know, the guys who were supposed to train her, like tried to get her fired instead. They didn't believe that a woman should be doing that job. But she had been like a, a battered woman, essentially. She had been in an abusive relationship and she had gotten the courage and the money to leave this guy because of the job in the factory. And so, you know, sort of that was a big takeaway for me is what that job meant to her totally beyond a paycheck. It was the ability to leave, you know, to, to leave that guy and start a totally new life where people respected her because of what she did and what she knew. Right. It's a powerful portrait. So, so let's, if we can, let's switch to Wally. He's the third person and the one we haven't talked about yet. He's a black man. Um, one thing I want to pick out for, about him, I mean, that was a great complicated portrait of him, but um, he, he doesn't usually give structural explanations. This is your word, structural. He usually, I mean, his, his usual way of thinking about the world is that he needs to work hard and demonstrate a personality. He's a very winning personality. So everybody right. likes him. Um, and that will get him through yeah. and he doesn't usually give structural explanations. The first time you see him give a structural explanation is when he realizes that the city is foreclosing people's ha black people's houses and selling them and only white people are buying them because they are the only ones who have capital and he sees that as wrong. So yeah. Yeah. of course, um, coming where I come from, I, I wanna give structural explanations for everything. Yeah. But I, I started thinking, well, I kind of understand why Wally doesn't because he doesn't really have an outlet for structural explanations. He doesn't have a way of acting on them. And his, and his, his completely individualized one explanations have, have worked for him in a precarious way. I mean, yeah. they, they don't always work to be, to be, to be but yeah. sometimes work. He's better off than he would be otherwise. Yeah, um, I learned so much for, uh, from Wally. He was the most op optimistic person that I'd ever met. Wally was, I met him at this uh, union rally actually, where he gives this fiery speech about interracial solidarity on the job. We got to stand and fight y'all. And all, you know, all, there's a long line of white union guys who want to hug him after he gives the speech and I'm standing in the line and, and, you know, I'm the last person in the line and I come up and I expect him to still be giving a fiery speech and instead he's like you know what there's no use in being mad about it right <laughs> and then he's like you know me personally i'm gonna start a barbecue so that was his dream his dream was to start this barbecue business he'd always wanted to do it and he thought the factory had been god had closed the factory so he could finally pursue his dream he was the only person i met up until that point who had a plan for what they were going to do. And a lot of the white guys were, you know, literally sobbing, literally falling apart because this job that they had been working at since high school was going away. And, and Wally was like, come on, y'all, stop tweeting at Trump, make a plan. <laughs> you know. So he actually, yes, he, he was, I think he was well served in a way by his belief in the American dream and his willingness to you know, he knew that there was racism. He knew that um, he had to work harder than everybody else to actually make it, but he didn't complain about it. He came from this family of, of, of entrepreneurs, hard workers, people from sharecropping South who were like, yeah, you're gonna have to work harder, work harder, do it. I call them the Condi Rice Black people. I don't call them that in the book, but I come from Condi Rice Black people, mm -hmm. people who are like, you know, you have to be twice as good, so be twice as good. <laughs> That's what we expect of you. And, and um, you know, by the time while that factory closed, Wally had one of the most coveted jobs in the plant. The union had given him this job that was essentially, you know, he got an office, he got to roam the plant at will, he got to do all this stuff that everybody else was wished that they could do. 
um, but because he was such a winning personality and the ones that were stewing about structural racism were actually not getting trained. There was a guy, Armanio, who, who, you know, he really believed in structural racism. He saw it. He had worked in a prison, private prison earlier, and he was so angry about what he saw there. But when he came and brought that into the factory, what it meant was that he was um, not forming bonds with his, he wasn't going to the union meetings. He wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't making friendships with the older guys who could train him on the machines. And he was lost. He couldn't actually do some, some, of, some of the work because he would complain to Wally, no one wants to train me. And, you know, so I think it served Wally pretty well to have that. It was almost a self-defense mechanism to have that sunny outlook because what are you going to do? The structure, you know, and it, actually his uncle who had worked in that, in that plant before told him like, don't keep hate in your heart because it's too much of a burden on you. Right. <laughs> it's going to kill you. It's not for them just you got to learn to let it go and that was so much of what the older generation was teaching Wally yeah so I, I think I read the book right I mean you're reinforcing my feeling which is that he benefits to a degree from that from that attitude although he's also very vulnerable and yeah. that he doesn't have a mechanism you can't you couldn't advise him I mean not that I would think I could advise him anyway but nobody could advise him you know act on your structural explanation because he doesn't really have a means I mean the union isn't I think partly because it's collapsing and the political parties aren't. Oh, am I missing? No, it's so he, interesting. He, when I analyze his life, he covered all bases and so did his uncle. They were in the union. They served in the union leadership. They were also nice to management. They got to know the managers, which is something the white union guys like would not do. Yeah. They, yeah. you know, they were, it was like they put down, you know, they covered every single base. And, and, and through doing all of those things, they've memorized the rule book, you know, through doing, got more education than everybody else, through doing every other thing, then they were, you know, they were in pretty good shape, <laughs> right? But you had to do all of that to get, to be in pretty good shape, yeah. But while he was the only, he was the happiest person after the factory closed, and that wasn't true of, of many workers. You mentioned a couple of minutes ago that um, on the whole, it's a generalization, but the, the white workers were more upset by the closing of the plants. Um, and, that, and that connects the other thing that a racial difference that emerges there is when, when they're being yes. asked slash ordered to train the Mexican people, the citizens of Mexico who are going to replace them. Yes. Um, the white workers are very hostile, only partly to the Mexicans, largely to the company but they're hostile. And the black workers have more mixed feelings, I think partly because some sense of empathy for the Mexicans, but partly because um, you said, because they didn't really expect the union job and the factory to last, they had, they had much less confidence in the whole system that the white workers had confidence in. That is, that is what, that was my strong feeling after a lot of those white workers had been there since high school, their dads had worked there, in some cases, their granddads worked there. That job was such a coveted identity for them. And it was theirs, right? They believed it, it was their birthright. It was something that it was probably the most valuable thing they would inherit from their parents, aside from their citizenship to this country. And, um, and they, you know, they they took it very seriously when it when it left. Um, the black workers, some of them, you know, they were you know they were angry. Some of them were were angry, but their their attitudes seemed so different. And one of them would say like, um, you know, uh, can't stop it from moving. Might as well ride the wave on out. So one of the you know one of the most uh, unapologetic trainers what is a guy named Mark uh, Mark Elliott a black guy very popular he he was you know re rejuvenated the bowling team everybody liked Mark but they were stunned when he just when he raised his hand to train and he was just like look dudes 
you know, we're, we got to move on, keep it moving. And a lot of the, a lot of the black workers had that attitude. They were like, we have experienced joblessness already. We've experienced, um, you know, we didn't think this company cared about us. Oh, you did really, you know? Um, so it was very interesting. Uh, uh, white workers were sabotaging machines, deliberately sabotaging machines, deliberately, um, uh, making sure that like parts, necessary parts, the machines would get lost when they shipped the machines to Mexico. I couldn't, the, the black workers could not believe it when I was telling them that. Yeah. Although they, didn't... they didn't believe it. They were like, nobody's doing that, you know, but of course it was happening. It, so that I, doesn't particularly surprise me. I mean, they're being asked to, they're, I guess they're getting a daily paycheck, but they're basically being asked to um, enable the company to profit more from the decision to move the factory. I mean, it's, I, I yeah. can see why you would, but I'm it not, was not endorsing think, sabotage, but to me, I can to get me, it. It was the, the difference in those emotional reactions kind of explains why none of the black workers I met voted for Trump. None of them. And they didn't buy the Trump. Ex they didn't trust him when he said he was going to be the, bring the factories back. They didn't trust him. And in fact, uh, Armania told me as soon as I heard Trump say tweet about Rex Nord, I signed up to train because I knew that our jobs were going away. Uh, like <laughs> that was how much they did not trust Trump because of Trump's, you know, long history of doing, you know, but the white workers didn't, they weren't attuned to that long history. And they were so hungry for that message that you deserve your job because you are an American and I am bringing that job back to you. They were waiting for someone to say it. And, you know, that was the message that, you know, Democrats used to be saying. And so, yeah, and by the way, it's not that different than the message Bernie Sanders talked about. Bernie Sanders talked a lot about outsourcing, greedy corporations, bringing the jobs back. And if you walked in this union hall, you will see on the wall, a big picture of Bernie Sanders. They endorsed Bernie Sanders. And it was only after Bernie Sanders lost the primary that a lot of the white workers voted for Trump. Some of it, it seems like it has to do with your sense of what kind of social contract you've got. And white workers thought they had a social contract. They feel like their contract is being betrayed. They think Trump at least is voicing an understanding of that. And the yeah. black workers never had, never felt they had a contract. And I mean, not in the deeper sense, they had a signed contract, but they didn't have a social contract. And also they definitely don't have a basis for a social contract with Trump because they know his own record on, on I, race. I also think there's there's a, another element, which is that black workers had seen some social progress, even though wages, there was a downward pressure on wages, manufacturing jobs were leaving. They still saw a black president for eight years. They still saw that their status was getting better. But if you were a white guy in that factory over the last 20 or 30 years, you saw your wages go down, you were giving up benefits every year. The only way you, your household was earning the same amount as five years ago is because now your wife goes to work and maybe you never see her now because you both work different shifts. And so like for them, it was just getting worse and worse and worse and there was no social progress. In fact, instead of you know, instead of social progress, now they're being called white privilege. Now they're getting, now they're getting hammered for, you know, being entitled and, and in language that comes out of left field and they're being lectured by college students. And so, you know, for them, they were just like, this is wrong. Everything's in the wrong direction. And, and I, I, that was my explanation after, you know, hearing from them. And you have a very subtle, um, complicated chapter called White Privilege, which is exploring both the fact that they do have white privilege and also the way that it comes across to them. And by the way, I went down a maybe a little bit of a rabbit hole, but you had reported that John's, at least the, the forebears who you mentioned, come from Perry County, Kentucky. So I was looking it up and, you know, third from the bottom out of more than 3,000 counties in the United States in life expectancy, um, a yeah. calamitous decline in life expectancy, 97% white voted for um, Democrats until... 2000, maybe yeah. even 2004, but voted overwhelmingly for Trump. Um, yeah, I mean, think about yeah. the cool, and I, I, this was something, I I never learned about the labor movement. I learned about, about the civil rights movement. I learned about the women's rights movement. I didn't know anything about the labor movement. So when I started going into the history of John's people in the coal mines, 
it was an eye opener to me. These are people who literally fought wars. There were literal wars with the coal companies in order to get things like a day off once a week. Or they, when they first started, they were not even paid money. They were paid in scrip, which was only redeemable at a company store. And so, you know, and they were, you know, they were proud and stubborn people who all had guns and they literally, you know, the cops were owned by the coal companies and um, and they would get shot and killed for striking. They, I mean, even as late as the 60s, when John's parents moved to Indianapolis, they were fleeing this kind of violence at the in the mines, around the mines. And um, I, I interviewed the daughter of a union leader who recounted how the coal company put explosives under her house, planted explosives under her house. I mean, it was, it was really eye-opening, very, very violent. And when you think about this idea of white privilege, it's, you know, that's why John was hated that. It, like, it just grated, you could see his reaction just when you say the words, he viscerally reacted. Because to him, nobody gave him that stuff, right? That he has, people, his people fought for those things, right? They fought for a middle-class wage. They fought for those things. And I, I guess it it really um, it really changed my idea of American history. If you think about the long sweep of American history, white men got those jobs. Like my coal mining was not a middle class job until coal miners fought a battle against the coal company, and then only white men or mostly white men, although there were some blacks in, in the mines. I actually found a lot of information mm. about black miners in West Virginia that was fascinating. But, um, but for the most part, those jobs were for white men. And then you had to fight a civil rights movement to get uh, black people the legal right to operate machines. And then you had to fight a the feminist movement to get women. And as soon as all of those things come together in 19, 1964, what, they had about 15 years and then those factories started going away. And so you, you have this huge group of people fighting for a dwindling pool of jobs. It's just a recipe for racial strife. I think it's, it's probably worth noting, I mean, even though you've, you've um, you, it's a very subtle and, and balanced discussion, discussion of white supremacy, of white uh, privilege, because it, I don't think the takeaway is you shouldn't talk about white privilege. I mean, it's real. It's just that it's a complicated picture, and he's also got cl a class. He's got a he's got a class analysis that's pretty important. Well, I mean, and I found right. I found I saw with my own eyes how much luckier John was than Shannon right. Wally. Right, like he didn't right. have to worry that. Right. You know, that uh, his co-workers might not train him because of his race or because of his gender. You know, he could buy a house in the suburbs, never worried, never thought about whether his kids would be accepted by their neighbors. You know, he bought a house in a, a place that had been a hotbed of the Ku Klux Klan. Like, wow. you know, all of these things that didn't occur to him. And even back to the miners in K Kentucky, they had, they had title to their land right, which meant something when there was coal underneath. And so all of these things that, you know, never would have occurred to him, I could see them. Um, and he couldn't, you know, he couldn't. But when you started talking to him about the union and you started talking to him about, hey, your union didn't let black men operate machines until 1964, you could see a way and a way, you know, you could see that arguments like that would move him because he cared about the union. And he believed, you know, his thing was, we're all equal now. We're all in the same plant. We're union brothers and sisters. Why do we have to keep talking about race? And so, you know, that was sort of, I, I came to appreciate that there was a really big change on the factory floors in the seventies. They went through a huge social change that we don't completely appreciate. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, now they're like, okay, can we, can we now just be equal and why are we still talking about this? So, well, that brings a question to, a, uh, uh, let's talk a little about the, the solidarity that exists because one of the moving things about the book is there's just every few pages, there's some moment of, 
of um, empathy or, or compassion or solidarity between people. I mean, I, you know, there's when the, the Mexican worker from, I mean, somebody from Mexico is um, getting trained and suddenly realizes that he's taking Shannon's job and he puts his hand on his chest and says, I'm sorry, I'm taking your job. Or when, you know, John, who we've just been talking about, he gets really worried that he may be in it kind of inadvertently taking away a job at the hospital from a black worker. Or when, um, you know, Wally physically embraces the white man who he's basically caught sabotaging the equipment, yeah. um, which he's against, but there's a difference, but his response is to hug the guy or, you know, what was most moving to me actually was when uh, Wally and his new girlfriend, Stacy, who I think has a sort of status advantage, a little class advantage over him, but they're yeah. up all night um, in the dark talking about all the burdens on him and he's weeping, which he's not supposed to do and she has those tears on her hands and so there are these moments of solidarity so one thing is I just would sort of propose I guess for your comment that one of the reasons the factory work is so important to folks is because it is a place of solidarity it's not just the machines it's the other people but also and then unemployment is so terrible because it kills the solidarity but the real I don't know if you agree but the real question is um how do we how do we build solidarity do you learn anything about that from um from this well, I know how not to build solidarity. You don't build solidarity when people are just sitting at home in their various houses getting getting a check. Like, you know, over COVID, everybody was just, you know, was, Shannon was so lonely. And even though she was actually earning more than she had been while she was working at her second factory, she was so uh, miserable um, <laughs> because there was no solidarity. There's no one to do anything with. But I, I was, I was, um, I participated earlier today in the Texas Book Festival, and there was a book about worker centers. I don't know if you've ever heard of where I was the first, my first exposure to them. But even without unions, there are these places called worker centers where people are, you know, most of them are temp workers, a lot of them are undocumented, and they're coming and talking about you know, learning about workers' rights. And so I thought it was a really interesting model. And, you know, to me, the big question is, where do we go from here? Like, do we, you know, there's so many, there's challenges to nationalism, challenges to, cha challenges to the idea of a nation state, right? Like globalization has thrown up these challenges. And to me, it's like, we have to foster solidarity, not just even among workers in, in the United States, but we have to bring up working standards elsewhere because that's what's part of the part of the problem. Um, you know, so uh, there's a there's uh, this young generation is going to have to learn. Um, I mean, I, I want to apologize to them for <laughs> how we haven't how we haven't solved uh, these problems, but um, but we're going to have to craft a new kind of globalization that, that is that is that is um, looking at how workers live, not just in the United States, but all around the world. Um, that's I'm, there was some there was some as a, as a side note, there was some interest in the rest of the world by these factory workers. I mean, one thing that was really startling was the two ex-employees, the two laid off employees who, who separately moved to the Philippines. Um, in one case, he doesn't even have any. Um, background and he buys a one-way ticket to Manila. Isn't that incredible? But, yeah. yeah. I wanted to know yeah. more about that, actually. Yeah. Um, find out what he did in, in the Philippines. In the other case, I think he had a family at, at, through, his, through his wife, right? But in one case, he doesn't even know the Philippines. He just goes. Um, so. Well, that's, I mean, that's, you know, if you're an American worker and you have a house and, you, you know, you, you think I'm never going to be employable again because all the factories are gone, maybe I can you know, live for the rest of my life off my savings there. Yeah. So um, let me ask one more question. Then we have some questions keyed up. Um, one, the last question is um, you, you know, you just, you describe, you finally discriminate, distinguish between um, Wally and, and John and Shannon and they're different because of, partly because of race and gender they're, and also for other reasons, their lives are different. But you also end up depicting them as having a lot in common and uh, culturally, yeah. Uh, values, food, all kinds of things, and yeah. very, very different from the planet that you fly in from when you come in from Cambridge, Mass., which yeah. is the planet that I live in. Um, so yeah. I wanted you to talk a little more about that, but especially I think the positives of, so your um, your admiration for the culture that's in Indiana, in Indianapolis factory. Talk, talk about them rather than what's wrong with us. Uh, talk right. about what's wrong, it's wrong with it's them. Yeah. So all of them, yeah. they were all in their 40s, 
around the same age as me, um, but they were all grandparents. Um, and I, you know, I have a five-year-old daughter. So, you know, they all, generation. Had, right, they, were... they all had kids young, right? Um, they all smoked or, or, or chewed tobacco. Um, the, they all owned guns or, or in Shannon's case, the men in our family owned, owned guns. They loved motorcycles. I mean, there were just things that even in music, food, I would go out to eat with John. I spent a lot of time in restaurants with them because in the beginning when I'm trying to get them to trust me, they didn't invite me to their houses right away. And, um, yeah, uh, they, they would make fun of the beer I ordered or, you know, and so you sort of realize that class is about culture it's about taste it's not just how much money you make and you, you have to, you have to understand that because so many of these news articles were like well you know economic grievance can't be uh, a reason people voted for trump because look they're making 70 grand or they're even more than that you know and you know you can be making 200 grand if you're a construction a guy in construction uh, and still have a working, a blue collar mentality and, um, you know, a blue collar culture. And so to me, I just came to sort of appreciate plain spokenness, no pretense, uh, lot, jokes, pranks, uh, calling people names, like, and, and I sort of saw a lot of, you know, a lot of what Trump was doing or how Trump operates is, is sort of an, an extreme, almost cartoonish example of how sometimes, you know, how they are. They, they tell these tall tales, these stories that, you know, are just too, too extreme to be believed, right? And, uh, you know, the uptightness, the diet. And, and I don't want to romanticize it because mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, it's not healthy, right? So um uh the union leader chuck jones he was the president of the whole local he he was smoked like a chimney even after having a uh, cancer removed from his stomach and uh, you know he'd be sitting there being like you don't have to pay that bill like it's you know talking about universal health care as he's like smoking like a chimney you know there were moments i was like i'm just not sure that i want to see this like i can't unsee that chuck <laughs> You know, you're not doing yourself any favors. I don't want universal health care with you smoking like a chimney like that. So it was it was just a there were moments that that um, but but then again, you know, I came to really respect how they would, you know, they were always fixing things themselves. Right. They would always try to fix something first. They knew how they were. And YouTube was just a godsend to them they would fix their cars they would fix their sinks everything and i think you know i called an electrician to change a light bulb like you know like that's you know but they were so can do and, and yeah i remember larry's uh mother shannon's boyfriend's mother who's like a crazy trumpy um, said, you know, you could probably learn how to do brain surgery on YouTube. You know, it, they were making use of what was there. And, you know, I had to think about like the stuff they know, we wouldn't have won World War II without that stuff, right? Being able to change all of our auto plants into uh, war making plants, into munition, being able to make munitions. And, you know, I'm just not sure that we want all that knowledge to just disappear. Because by the way, when the factory moves, a lot of the innovation move, and you can see that research and development are moving and because uh, you know a lot of things are invented on factory floors. And so, you know, we don't wanna become a country where we don't know how to make anything anymore. And where it's all just like, you know, people on Wall Street making financial products that nobody understands. I I'm not sure I wanna be that. And, and just to be explicit too, they use the can-do uh, spirit and, the, and techniques on, on to improve the performance of the company. I mean, Shannon in particular is is uh, very concerned about making those machines work. And it seems to me that much beyond what she would be um, overseeing, you know, nobody's going to know some of the stuff she does because she's committed to doing a good job. Um, so that was the other, actually, that was the other thing that really jumped out at me was sort of going the extra mile for the quality of the work until things really dissolve. I mean, 
it's different when they're sabotaging the equipment because it's going to Mexico. But up until then, there's a feeling of pride in the in the quality of the work. Yeah, and some of those machines were really old. And that's another thing is these, you know, American manufacturing, the golden age, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, that's when a lot of these plants were built and then now they're old. So these companies are making a decision, do I build a new, a, a brand new facility right here or do I build it over there where it's cheaper? And so that's one of the, you know, one of the structural reasons why so many plants left. It's another one. So uh, great. So we're going to uh, move to questions from the audience. We have a bunch. And the first one's going to be from Jackson Weatherill, who is going to ask by video. Yeah, thanks, Farah. Uh, I'm Jackson Weatherill. I'm a first year student here at Tufts. Uh, and I'm actually in Professor Levine's Intro to Civic Studies class. Um, and I'm curious about your thoughts on how Democrats can tailor their messaging about the Build Back Better plan uh, to the working class more effectively. Awesome question. I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, I just wrote a piece in Politico about that. Um, I think we have to stop talking about free college and talk about apprenticeship programs to get in the trades. Uh, like a lot of these blue collar people think, you know, if think that when politicians talk about free college, they're just saying, here's a way to become more like me. And, you know, some of those blue collar people don't want to be just like us. You know, they might, they might say, my path is in the trades. I want to work with my hands. I want to be a pipe fitter or I want to, you know, and frankly, some of them make a lot more money uh, doing those trades than they would if they had gone, go to college. And, and, and so I do think um, listening to, and, and by the way, the Build Back Better Plan does have uh, an expansion of the pre-apprenticeship programs and the trades. It does, but you don't hear politicians talking about it, right? It has a lot about jobs in it. Um, and yet, you know, it's being pitched as an entitlement bill. And so to me, I think, you know, it shouldn't surprise us that work is important to the working class, like, you know, the respect for work. Um, I Every worker I met had, they knew people who were gaming the system. They knew people who could have had jobs, but were living off the, you know, living off the government on disability or this, that, and the other. And it, they resented it. And, and so that, you know, I think to pitch the Build Back Better plan as a jobs program and say, for those people who are who are working, we we want to make sure that work pays. That you that that it's respected that you you shouldn't be living in poverty when you're working full time in America. I mean those things I think resonate. Bernie resonated with a lot of the blue collar people I talked to, and he does talk a lot about uh, jobs and making sure that people who have jobs in America are not hungry. Great, thank you, and thanks Jackson for the good question, and see you on Wednesday. Um, so we have a question from Stephen Bloomfield in the chat. Um, I'm just going to read it. Um, I haven't had a chance to read your book yet, though I, I have it, exclamation point. If um, Shannon, Wally, and John have children, what are their prospects? What are their prospects for employment? How do they feel about their children's prospects? And how are they preparing them for a life that's probably going to be very much unlike their own? Um, they all have children. And um, they uh, there's varying degrees of... I, of prospects. So I think for a lot of the steel workers' daughters, they were aspiring to be nurses or veterinarians. Um, for the son, for the a lot of the sons, the path was less um, less clear. And you know, you could work in a warehouse. You could um, you could uh, pour cement. There was a lot of uh, construction was a big blue collar job uh, in Indianapolis. Um, but John has two sons and they ended up working um, for uh, basically fixing either maintenance or vehicles for a school system and loving it, like having a great time in a garage with seven guys, you know, like, so, you know, they found their way um, into a, a stable job. Um, 
and thought, you know, in their early 20s, they were thinking about how do I get a pension? How do I get a job with pension? Like, you know, so um, I think there, there are jobs like that. They're, they're not unlimited, right? And so um, I think, you know, I heard that a lot from the older generation of steel workers is even if I'm okay, even if I have my pension and my house is paid off, I don't know what the kids are gonna do. I don't know what the grandkids are gonna do. And John's mother told me that once, the healthcare industry is only so big because that's the only place that was hiring. You know, in a lot of these places, all there, you know, there's a hospital, there's, you know, that's the only place you can, the healthcare is like the new factory. And so um, I do think it's, I worry about, I worry about that a lot. I think I'm going to just ask you one more question because even though it's not broadcast to TV and we could we could go a few seconds over, um, I think we should wrap at the at the expected time. So, um, so this is a question from a, a sophomore, Saya Ameli Hajabi. I hope I pronounced her first name right. She's a, a sophomore studying environmental engineering, and she's got a question that's a little bit more think about craft about your as a reporter, your job as a reporter. So, like, how do you? How do you um, figure out who to interview, and how do you? Uh, I would say, how do you break the ice and get and get the honest answers that you get? It's a great question. Um, I started off just like, who would accept a really nosy reporter <laughs> hanging out with them? It wasn't easy in the beginning. Like a lot of workers, they were they were busy. They worked like ten to twelve hours a day, and they didn't have the time. And so I ended up following Shannon because she was literally the only woman who would let me follow her. And I would, um, I would drive to her house before her shift and leave my car at her house and drive with her to work. That was literally the only time she had um, in the day. And so, yeah, it's not easy to get people to trust you. And you also have to spend a lot of time with them to really understand their lives. It took me years. It took me at least two years to really put together um, what is going on with their life. And when you first meet them, you, you know, oh, they're just, you know, they're not all that different than me. And it takes years to really say, oh my God, this is your second plan closing. Okay, you went through a bankruptcy and lost everything you had because of the first one. Like, oh, it had this effect on your kids. Like, you know, it takes a lot of conversations to see that and it, just observing them. And even still, there's a lot I probably don't know about them because there's only so much you can learn about people from even from a lot of close observation. And all three of them have gone through an awful lot. Um, I mean, in what, a lot of what Wally went through it was because he was black and a lot of what Shannon went through was because she was a woman, but all three of them went through an awful lot. Um, and drama. life is hard anyway for everybody, but life is really hard for them, especially considering that they're only in their 40s. Yeah. I mean, they, they yeah. bore, they've borne an awful lot of, of suffering and tragedy and um, conflict and yeah. So um, we have a couple more more good questions, but I think we're just gonna have to leave them as questions. And um, I mean, they're just gonna have to float there and I bet other people have questions too, because we should probably um, wrap. But um, I, just wanna, um, I just wanna thank you again for joining us and for the great conversation um, and for your answers, which are so thoughtful and valuable. And also I, do, I think I, I should plug the book again uh, in all sincerity buy it and read it. It's really compelling. It's a very good read. It's a lot, it's a lot more fun than the stuff I assign in my classes. It's, it's a lot better read. So, um, but seriously, thank, thank you so much for joining us and thanks everybody who is on the, is, is, is on here as a participant and thanks for the questions and uh, have a good evening, everyone. Hey, thanks. Thanks so much for having me.